Praise God. Good to uh, to see all of you in the house of the Lord this morning. Thanks so much for coming out. I know the weather was a bit crazy yesterday, and some places got a lot of snow, more than others. I see Caleb back there shaking her head. I think you guys got to... A little more maybe than we did here, but thank you all, especially those of you that have braved maybe some elements to uh, to get here today. It's so good to um, to see you. But I, I started last Sunday a two part uh, sermon series that I entitled "End Time Events," and I'm going to conclude that with you this morning. and And my prayer through this series from from last week until today. I know I gave you a lot of information last week and a, and a lot of scripture references, but my prayer is that the, these messages would be clear, that these messages would be understandable because there's so much about the book of Revelation that we have difficulty with. There's so many allegories and there's so much figurative language that is used that it makes it sometimes a difficult uh, for, for uh, even the most scholared person or schooled person to sit down and really read that book and fully understand. I don't know if there's anybody alive uh, the maybe that really fully understands all of the implications of the book of Revelation. But this is what I do know. I, I believe that one, one place that we kind of go astray is we sort of focus on the book of Revelation as a book of, of plagues and a, a book of destruction and, and a book of devastation. And, and we focus on, you know, the arrival of, of the Antichrist and the false prophet and, of course, the, the focus on the devil. But I want to tell you today that is not should not be the focus of our attention. That that should not be where all the emphasis is placed, uh, even though that's what I'm going to be talking about today. That should not be where the emphasis is placed about the book of Revelation. And you know why? Because if you look up the entire title, it's not just the revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a book about who God was, who he is, and who he forever is going to be. And I think that is where we should really focus our time and our attention when we study, perhaps, uh, the book of Revelation. This is what Jesus said concerning the end times. He said, of the day... And of the hour, no man knows. Not the angels in heaven, not even the Son. Only the Father knows. So let me make this clear. Anybody that wants to claim there's 88 reasons why the Lord is going to return in 1988, or anybody that claims the end of the world is coming in 2012, because their calendar has run out, they are delusional. We do not know the precise moment. We, we don't know the month or the year that the Lord Jesus is, is going to come back. We don't know when the, the time clock, if you will, is going to begin to tick down on this world as we know it. I thought for sure. Jesus was going to come back in year 2000. Anybody else? Remember all that Y2K stuff? Computers are crashing. The world's going down as we know it. We're storing water and food, not knowing what's going to happen. I thought for sure that was it. We had an all-night prayer meeting at the church, and I thought there ain't no better place to be but for me to be in the church when I'm going to get raptured. So I was here. I was about 20 years old. I was down here at the altar, man. I was praying, seeking the Lord, watching my clock. I'm like 11.55. Woo! Five minutes, I'm going to see the Lord. I was praying, man. I was believing. I looked at my, my watch again. It was 11.59. I'm like, Lord, in just 60 seconds, I'm going to see the king. I got kind of wound up me praying. I looked at my watch, and it was 12.01. I said, God, you're late. And as you know, he did not come back in 2000. And I got to be honest, I was a bit disappointed. Man, I was looking for him. I was ready, watching, waiting. But you know what? I've not quit. 
from 2000 right on up now to 2017, I have not stopped watching. I have not stopped longing for the appearing of the Son of God in the clouds. Because I know this, he may not have come in year 2000. He may not have come in 1988. He may not have come in 2012. But soon and very soon, I am going to see the King coming in power and great glory. Let me say this, when you turn on your television and Jerusalem is the focus of the world news, it is time to get your eyes on the sky. Because the Lord Jesus, the end is near, it is right at the door. Hebrews 9.28 said unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto sal. Is anybody looking today? Can I encourage you with these words? Don't stop looking for the king. Don't stop watching and waiting. He is coming back soon and very soon. Keep your eyes on the sky. We may not know the exact hour. We may not know the day, we may not know the month or the year, but we can know something. And that is the signs. That's exactly what Jesus told his disciples when they asked him, when is the end coming? And he began to list some signs that would take place. Let's look at the book of Matthew, chapter 24, beginning in the third verse, the same text, uh, scripture text that I used last Sunday. I want to read that again, Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse number 3. It says, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they said, tell us when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out that nobody deceives you. For many, somebody say many, many are going to come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. That it continues such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Anybody remember the earthquake that happened in our little area just a few months ago? All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then he said, you'll be handed over to be persecuted. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. How many know there is already an intolerance for Christians? There's already an intolerance for what we believe. When you start picking up this book and you start preaching what the good book says, there's an intolerance for you. People do not want to hear what you have to say. You'll be hated by all nations. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. They'll betray and hate each other. It goes on, many false prophets will appear. They will deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most, if that is not a, a startling phrase from the mouth of God, the love of most is going to grow cold. We had better keep the fire burning. It'll grow cold. But he said the one that endures to the end shall be saved. This gospel will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Kudos to all of you who are a part of mission work because you are ushering in the end of time. It will be preached to the whole world, and then the end will come. Matthew 24 goes on to say, We can know the signs of the times. The signs of the times by looking around at the condition of our day. Jesus said it would be as it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? They were eating. 
They were drinking, having a good time, enjoying life. They were oblivious until the flood came and they were destroyed. How many know, folks, we're living in a day and age when most people are living for the momentary pleasures of this life? They have no thought to morality. They give no thought to accountability. The phrase, you only live once, that's the motto for their lives. I'm going to do what best suits me today and not think about tomorrow. It is today as it was in the days of Noah. Jesus also said there would be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. What kind of signs? Specifically, The Bible said the sun would be turned to darkness and the moon would be turned into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. Anybody remember the blood moons of 2014 and 2015? How many remember the the solar eclipse that happened just a few months ago where in the middle of the day, The sun turned dark, and another solar eclipse like that projected seven years from now. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what Jesus perhaps was referring to, but I can say this, it will certainly make you stop and consider. Jesus said, when you see the leaves begin to bud, and you know that summer is near, He said, in the same way, when you see these signs, you will know that the end is near. It is right at the door. Matthew 24, 44 said, keep watch. Keep looking. For the Son of Man will come at an hour when you are not expecting him. Don't be like the foolish virgins who were not ready when the bridegroom showed up. Their wicks weren't trimmed. There was no oil in their lamps. And what happened? The bridegroom came. He took the ones that were ready and he was gone and the door was closed. The opportunity to be invited to the wedding banquet was gone. They were left behind. I believe that the Lord is issuing a wake-up call in these last days for the lost to know this. The age of grace is coming to an end. The days of God's mercy are coming to a close. Very soon, Jesus Christ is going to cease to be our Savior, and He's going to be our judge. Not because He's unjust. Not because He's unfair. Don't give me that hogwash, how could God be fair if he would punish people and send them to hell? Here's what Romans chapter 2 verse number 5 says. By our own stubbornness, because of my unrepentant heart, I have stored up God's wrath against me. That the day of his righteous judgment will be revealed. Last week we talked in detail about The end times, we focused more on the end times last week. How they relate to us as Christians, how they relate to us as believers. We we can look forward, the church, the body of Christ, Sister Faith, we can look forward to the future with great anticipation. We talked about glorious things that will happen, including the, the rapture of the church, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ, the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ, and a brand new heaven and a brand new earth that we will forever enjoy for all of eternity in the presence of God. Can somebody say amen? Thank you, Lord, for that. But today we're going to talk about a subject with regard to end time events that's not quite as exciting as the one last week was. But they're just as important. They're just as pertinent. They're just as true. End time events, how do they relate to people who have rejected God's gift of salvation. When the church is raptured, or as 1 Thessalonians talks about, we mentioned last week, we are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Those who are not ready, like the foolish virgins who were not ready, they will be left behind. Now there's been some movies. How many have seen some of those 
Left Behind series movies. There's been some movies with that title that have tried maybe to give us a, a little glimpse as to what the world will be like when the church is gone. When he that restrains has been taken out of the way. And when wickedness and sin is left to run rampant all over the earth. But I don't believe those movies really do it justice. I don't believe that anything can quite prepare us for the time of anarchy, for the time of lawlessness, for the time of judgment that is coming on this earth. It is referred to in the Bible as the tribulation or the great tribulation. Scripture references Revelation 7 verse 14 and Matthew 24, 21. The tribulation. Now what are we talking about there? There is a time frame for the tribulation. So let's talk about that for just a moment. There's a prophecy in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel that prophesies 70 weeks. Say 70 weeks. 70 weeks that are prophesied actually against the nation of Israel. And there is a, a particular purpose for these weeks. Daniel said it will, they will make, these weeks will make an end of sin and they will bring in everlasting righteousness. So we're talking about at the end of those 70 weeks is that time when the Lord Jesus Christ we talked about last week is going to show up on the earth and is going to bring with him all the armies of heaven and he's going to establish complete worldwide peace and righteousness and holiness. That's the purpose of those 70 weeks. But when do they happen? If we're talking about when they actually occurred or will occur, uh, those 70 weeks are better understood as one week being equivalent to seven years or one year per day of the week. So if you look at it in those that, that context, then you have 70 weeks equals 70 weeks of seven years or 70 times seven for those mathematicians is 400 and 90 years is what was prophesied. Now, when, when did those years start? Daniel 9.25 answers that question. It says the clock starts on the 490 years when the command is given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's what happened under King Artaxerxes in 445 B.C. When, does the, when did the clock stop? Well, according to verse 26 of chapter 9 in Daniel says, the clock will stop when the Messiah is cut off. The Messiah is cut off. How many know that happened when he was crucified in 32 A.D.? So if you take that, the math from 445 B.C. until 32 A.D., it will give you a total of 483 years. Is that the complete prophecy? What's 490 minus 483? Seven. There are seven years of that prophecy that have not come to pass yet. Daniel's 70th week is what we're still waiting on. We're living in the church age. I mentioned to you last Sunday that time between the 69th week and the 70th week. We don't know how long this time span is going to last. But the clock will start again on those seven years when the church is raptured and they leave this earth. The clock starts and there is another seven years to come to pass to fulfill the prophecy given by Daniel. A seven-year period known as the tribulation. That seven-year period, it will result in the total eradication of sin at the end. And the establishment of complete righteousness on the earth. Now I want to talk about, for just a moment, the people of the tribulation. What kind of folks are going to be involved in what's happening to the world? First off, there will be a new world leader at the beginning of those seven years that will come on the scene. He is known throughout Scripture as the Antichrist. He will quickly rise to the world stage with a claim of peace, with a claim of prosperity, in the midst of what is great chaos, in the midst of what is a lot of fear because people are missing, families are gone, children are gone, governmental leaders will be gone. Maybe. There will be a lot of anarchy and great confusion 
in the world as we know it. But here comes this world leader with a promise of leading us to a better hope, leading us to a brighter tomorrow. The Bible says this world leader, the Antichrist, is going to make a covenant with many for a period of one week or seven years. There's the time frame again, according to Daniel 9, verse 27. The first half of those seven years, the first three and a half years, are going to be a time of seemingly look like a time of just reconstruction, a time of reorganization of the world's government under this new world leader who unbeknownst to the world is getting his power and his prestige and his prominence through the power of Satan, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9. This world leader is also known as the beast in Revelation chapter 13. This is what Revelation says about the beast. He'll make a covenant of peace. But in the middle of that week, in the middle of of seven years, so at three and a half years, he's going to break the covenant of peace that he's made with Israel. What will happen? He will set himself up as God. He will renounce the Lord Jesus Christ. He will demand the worship of the Jews and even the world. He will establish a one world religious system that will be forced to honor him and worship him as God. And then he will control the world's economic infrastructure. After the Antichrist, the Bible says a second beast comes on the scene. This gentleman is known as the false prophet. He will be a proponent of this new one world religion. He will appear on the scene exercising all the power of the Antichrist. He will even give life to a graven image that he is erected in the the form of the Antichrist, and he will force people, he will all around the world, the Bible says, force them to bow down and to worship the image and to worship the beast that has been made and erected in Israel. He will force every person that's on this earth to take a mark in your right hand, Or in your forehead. We've read the Bible. We know the mark of the beast we talk about is the number 666. However, that comes about in some kind of a a barcode, maybe or something along those lines. But somehow that mark will be attributed and placed on your body. And we see all the science is already kind of happening, these chips and things that are being placed. I mean, it's just it's just paving the way for all these things to fall into place. Well, I just won't take the mark, preacher, if I'm left behind. Well, guess what? You don't take it, you don't eat. Because now you can no longer buy and you can no longer sell without the mark. You'll find that in Revelation 13, 17. Also, if you do not worship the beast, if you don't pledge your allegiance to the Antichrist and take the mark, Revelation 13, 15 tells us you will be slaughtered. You'll be killed if you don't. Pledge your allegiance. This is going to bring about a time of events of cataclysmic proportion. I've heard folks say, well, you know what, if I, if I don't have to get ready right now, if I, if I miss the rapture, I'll just get saved during the tribulation. Can I tell you something, folks? If you can't serve God now, you will never serve him during the tribulation. It will be nearly impossible when they drag, man, your family members out. They drag you out and, man, they start doing all kinds of punishment things to you. You Talk about waterboard and you ain't seen nothing. Until they drag you out and you can't buy, you can't eat, you can't sell. People are starving to death. You'll do anything to put food in your mouth. Serve God now while you still have a chance. Serve him now while the age of grace is still upon this earth. Don't wait till then. Judgment of God is going to be poured out on the entire earth. Judgment through plagues that will result in changes in the sun, the moon, the stars, and even the rivers. Revelation tells us there'll be earthquakes, there'll be natural disasters, there'll be severe famine, there'll be economic and financial disruptions and wars involving significant loss of life. Here's what Revelation 6, 4 says of that time. Peace will be removed from the entire earth. 
Matthew 24, 21 says, There will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. You talk about a day of judgment, a day of God's wrath being poured out on those who rejected His salvation. The last three and a half years, that time period known as the Great Tribulation, the Bible says there'll be a time when men will, will pray for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and crush me and hide me from the face of Him who sits on the throne. But even in the midst of God's judgment, even in the midst of, of these, these great uh, plagues and wrath that's poured out on the world, you know what God's plan still is? For man to renounce the Antichrist. For mankind to receive and accept God's gift of salvation that only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be saved from the eternal punishment that is yet to come. I don't know how soon this may happen. I don't know at what point, how quickly we may be in the tribulation. But I would say this. It's a reminder to you and perhaps anybody maybe be watching this video on the internet at some time in the future listening to this CD. Whatever you do, do not take the mark of the beast. Whatever you do, renounce him at all costs. Even if it costs you your life. Because there's still the potential, the ability, the Holy Spirit is still available, calling and wooing and wants to save you. Because the worst is still yet to come. As the seven years of tribulation comes to a close, here's what we see now according to Daniel 7, 24. Revelation 13 verse 1 tells us that the Antichrist is now seen, this beast is now seen with ten horns upon his head. What are these horns? They, they symbolize a league of ten nations, possibly a revived Roman Empire, a federation of the leading powers of the world that are gathering together, and the Antichrist is at the helm. He's their leader. He gathers these kings. He gathers these nations who have pledged their allegiance to him, and he's off to Israel. His, his thought, his, his desire is the total annihilation of God's people. But how many knows that's not going to happen? His desire, his plan, his goal is to keep Christ from coming back from heaven to earth and establishing his kingdom here on the earth. He wants to prevent that from happening. So they're gathered to the Middle East. The Antichrist, these federations, leading powers of the world, these armies, to try to assault Israel. But all of a sudden, their focus will shift from Israel to the sky. Because while all these armies have gathered to assault Israel, something else was happening. Jesus was getting up off the throne of glory. And he was getting all the armies in heaven assembled. And all of a sudden, they look up and they see the king coming in power and great glory with all the armies of heaven following him on white horses. For the glorious second coming of Christ. And for one final battle with evil. Known as Armageddon. See at his arrival. The light of the Antichrist is going to be eclipsed by another light. For the son of righteousness will have arisen with the healing in his wings. And the bright and morning star is going to light up the heavens with the glory of God. As the Son of God appears, is what the Bible says in Revelation 19, verse 19. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and all of their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. That was their first mistake. And it will be their last to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. As they gather to make war on Israel, their attention shifts. They see Christ coming. He's coming to set up that everlasting righteousness we talked about, that perpetual holiness here on the earth. When he returns, here's what happens. The Bible says the beast or the Antichrist 
along with the second beast, the false prophet, they are captured and cast alive into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, 20 is where you'll find that reference. All the rest of those that have gathered, the armies that have gathered to make war against Christ and against the armies of God, they will be consumed by the sword that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. Can I tell you with just one word, with just one spoken word, the armies of Satan and the Antichrist will be destroyed in a moment, in a split second. That is the power of the great God that we serve. That is the power of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. With one word, they're devoured and destroyed and consumed. Revelation 19, 21 says that the birds will be filled with the flesh of God's enemies. Zechariah 14 verse 12 prophesied a time when those who fight against God will have their flesh consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will consume away in their sockets and their tongues will consume away in their mouths. Can I tell you something, folks? This is the destiny that awaits those who reject God. The future of man is bleak apart from the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Following that battle of Armageddon, following the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, the devil is released one more time. Now, I've had folks ask me the question, why? Why? He's been bound up for a thousand years. You heard me last week. He's been shut up. Praise God. For a thousand years, why would he be released? Remember, when Christ comes back, those who've rejected him and pledged their allegiance to the Antichrist, they'll be removed from the earth. They'll be held in Hades or a place of darkness awaiting that final judgment coming from the Lord. The only folks left on the earth will be righteous people, holy people, because righteousness is going to cover the entire earth. I told you last week, theologians believe longevity of life will return. People will begin to live in these natural bodies, not us in glorified bodies, but those that have survived the tribulation in a natural flesh body will continue to live in that flesh body for hundreds of years possibly. During that time, children will be born upon the earth. Those children have never known sin. They've never known unrighteousness. All they've known is what it means to be holy. All they've known is what it is to be righteous because Jesus is the governing, leading power of the world in Jerusalem. That's all they know. One last time, an opportunity is presented for mankind. Even at the end of the age, Jesus does not take away your free will to make a choice. Satan is released to all the folks still living on the earth, and they've got a choice to make. Follow Jesus, Jerusalem, or you follow Satan. I'm sad to report that there are people in the earth at that time that will follow Satan. He will gather those armies together, and they will go to Israel. They'll go to Jerusalem. The Bible says they surround God's holy city. What does he think he's going to do? I mean, after all that's happened, he still thinks somehow maybe. Maybe he's not read the end of the book, but I have. All the armies of of Satan around the earth, they gather around God's holy city. You know what the Bible says happens? Fire falls from heaven and consumes them right away. It's not even a battle. There's not even a fight. They're in a losing war. Fire falls from heaven and consumes them right where they stand. Unrighteousness is dealt with and eliminated from the earth once again. And what happens? That's Revelation 20, verse 9, by the way. The Bible says Satan is cast into the lake of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet who are already there. 
And then the rest of the wicked dead. Those that rejected the gift of salvation time and time and time again. They stand before God for the final time. In what is known as the great white throne judgment. Here's what Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 through 15 says. They can come to the instruments. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for these people. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. I've heard some folks ask, man, what, what if they've been cremated? What's going to happen to their body? Have you been in the ground long enough? You've ashes anyway. If he made it, I know he can remake it and restore it. The sea gives up the dead. Death and Hades give up the dead. And they're all judged. Each one according to his work. Then it says, death and Hades were cast into the eternal lake of fire. And this is the second death. Thank God the Bible says we don't have to die twice. We might have to die once in this earthly body, but my spirit can live on eternally with God. But those whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they were cast into the eternal Lake of fire. I want you for just a moment to think about eternity. We talked about eternity last week, you know, and and, and it was great things. It was how can we imagine an eternity, unending time spent with the Lord around His throne. He's just, what are we going to be doing? Where are we going to be? Who are we going to see? Times of joy and refreshing from the Lord. For an endless timeless eternity but on the other hand I want you to think about eternity in the other direction a timeless eternity a never ending world separated from God see I believe the the, the lake of fire the, the worst thing about the lake of fire is not the unrelenting death. It's not the eternal punishment. It's not even the perpetual fire itself. The worst part of the lake of fire is the eternal separation from God. The eternal separation from all things that are holy, all things that are righteous, all that is godly, forever separated for all of eternity. That, my friend, is what awaits anybody whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm begging you today, do not delay God is setting before us two paths life or death but he's begging you today to choose life that you may live eternally today is the day of salvation choose you this day who you will serve as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord Would you stand to your feet all over this sanctuary this morning? I believe that I've presented to you as clearly as I know how. The truth, the reality 
of what awaits those who have rejected God. Here's the question. What in this world could there possibly be that would be worth you losing your soul eternally? What does it profit a man, the Bible says, if he could gain this whole world? Thing that it offers but loses soul I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and your hearts with me for just a moment and I'm going to ask you a very sobering question one that I believe God if you don't answer now he will require of you one day are you ready to meet the Lord I'm telling you, the rapture of the church could happen before I get these next words out of my mouth. Are you ready? Young people, there's no relationship that's worth you missing heaven. We can't be living one way on Friday night and another way on Sunday morning. It is time to stop playing the church game. This is not a game. This is truth. It's reality. And you are going to be left behind. He's coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. You've got to have your sin stain washed away in the life-giving flow of the blood of Jesus. But he offers that gift to you today. A free gift. All we have to do, the only prerequisite on our part is that we recognize, we acknowledge, we admit that we are a sinner. That we need God's grace. We need to be saved. We need to be forgiven. We need to repent of our sins. And He will forgive us, 1 John 1, 9 says, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're here today, I want you to to do some introspection in your life. I want you to ask yourself, is there anything in my life that would prevent me from making heaven my home? I do not want to endure what that preacher has talked about. I don't want to go through the tribulation. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to have to endure the arrival of the Antichrist and being forced to take the mark and forced to worship the beast and then stand before God finally in that great white throne judgment where I'm eternally separated from God and His people and everything that's righteous. I don't want to endure that. I want to be saved today. I want to know that I'm ready. All over this sanctuary, I'm going to ask one time, if this is you and you know that you need to repent of your sin, you know there's something in your heart that's not right with God, and you got to make it right today. You're not leaving this house until you do. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now over the sanctuary.